I saw an excellent publication today about the safety of different multiple sclerosis disease modifying therapies in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic. And these authors give their opinion on how we should manage multiple sclerosis and whether or not different disease modifying therapies are safe given the pandemic. And the authors are very well respected. They come from a lot of different areas. For instance, first author is Dr. or Professor, I should say, Gavin Giovanoni, who's a well respected multiple sclerosis specialist in London, who has a very popular multiple sclerosis research blog, which I'll link in the description below. Also, for example, a Dr. Emanuela Wabant, who's a well known pediatric multiple sclerosis specialist at University of California, San Francisco. And they talk about COVID 19 in general and what they know about the virus and what they know about what part of the immune system, particularly T lymphocytes, and how they're involved in fighting the virus. And they created this table with different disease modifying therapies and their comment about what we should do with these medications and what you should consider. Now, I want to give you the caveat that, of course, you should discuss this with your own doctor. This is not all evidence based, a lot of this is opinion based. And I'm essentially just going to summarize what they have in the article and in the table. And I would suggest that you make your own decisions by yourself and with your own provider. And everyone's situation is a little bit different. Now, they group these different agents into categories. So they think that the following agents are very low risk. Interferon beta products, such as beta seron, Avinex, Rebif, and Plegrity, glutiram or acetate products, such as Copaxone and Glitopa, along with teraflunamide or Abagio. Now, interferons, beta interferons, are proteins that are naturally secreted by the liver in response to viral infections. And they work by sort of diverting the immune system to more of a T helper cell type 2 phenotype. So they don't really weaken the immune system, they just sort of modulate the immune system. Now, they mentioned that these drugs have some antiviral properties and speculate they could even be beneficial in COVID-19. I don't think there's any specific evidence about that, but they're likely safe to take and to continue, and that is, in fact, what they recommend. Glutiram or acetate works sort of like an allergy shot. It's a protein that sort of resembles myelin. It doesn't really normally enter the bloodstream and doesn't weaken the immune system, so they feel that it's safe to continue it. Now, teraflunamide or abagio is a little bit interesting. It works on pyrimidine or DNA synthesis, and it basically inhibits certain rapidly dividing cells, as in certain immune cells. And despite that mechanism of action, studies show that it's not really a strong immunosuppressive. There aren't really a lot of infections associated with it. They also mentioned that it does have some antiviral properties. Me personally, I would think it's likely a little bit higher risk than glutiram or acetate and interferon beta. They put it in the same category very low, but there's no specific reason to stop it according to these authors. Then they talk about a few medications which are relatively low risk. One would be the fumaric esters, such as dimethylfumarate, tecfidera, and also vumerity, for instance. And this drug, it's a little bit unclear how it works, but one of the effects it can have is to reduce the white blood cell count. And this occurs in some people, but not in all people. And it is known that this drug, Tecfidera, can sometimes result in viral infections. And of course, the most feared example is progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. And there are rare cases of this serious brain infection caused by the JC virus, but it's mostly associated with low lymphocytes. In particular, if the absolute lymphocyte is less than 800, that's known to be associated with a higher risk of infection. So they recommend to just continue the medication if the absolute lymphocyte count is not low, but to change or stop the medication if it is low. Another interesting drug is Tysabri, or natalizumab. This drug works by blocking the lymphocytes from entering the nervous system. So it doesn't really kill the immune system or weaken the immune system directly. It's kind of like an immune sequestrant. It sequesters the immune system outside of the central nervous system. So it shouldn't really increase the risk of getting pneumonia in theory. There is a theoretical concern that in some cases SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that causes COVID-19, could actually be neurotrophic. In other words, it could get into the central nerv nervous system. And there was, in fact, a case of encephalitis with COVID-19. Now, this is likely rare, but it is theoretically possible 
possible that Tysabri could increase the risk of this complication. Also, it turns out that Tysabri works in the gastrointestinal tract and is in fact a licensed treatment for Crohn's disease, an autoimmune disease of the gastrointestinal tract. And of course, COVID-19 may have some effect in the gastrointestinal tract as abdominal pain and diarrhea can be symptoms of that condition. Nonetheless, they feel that overall the risk is relatively low and it's likely safe to consider. Another thing I've heard some doctors doing is giving it less often, such as every six weeks instead of the FDA approved regimen, which is every four weeks. Then we move on to the sort of intermediate risk drugs in their opinion. One category would be drugs that work on the sphingosine 1-phosphate receptor, such as fingolimod or gelenia or siponimod Mazent or the newer drug ozonamod. And these drugs essentially trap the T lymphocytes within the lymph nodes. So they don't kill the T so cells, but they trap them in the lymph nodes and they can make the T cell counts very low. So in theory, they would be a little bit higher risk because they do affect the T cells, the cells that are very involved in fighting SARS-CoV-2, the virus which causes COVID-19. That being said, generally speaking, the risk of viral infections isn't that high high with these drugs, there is an increased risk of shingles, and there are rare cases of PML, but they're relatively uncommon. The overall risk of viral infections isn't that high. So according to these authors, they think that you could go ahead and continue it or possibly temporarily suspend the dose. The problem with suspending the dose is that there's a risk of rebound activity when you stop these drugs, and in some cases it can be quite a severe rebound. Another potential strategy would be to take the drug less often often and allow the T lymphocytes to rise somewhat, but there's no specific guideline on that. Another class of drugs is the anti-CD20 class. Now, Don, Professor Giovanni had a separate article specific on this, and I made a video on it, so if you want to take a look at that in more detail, I'll go up ahead and put up a link. But the anti-CD20 drug class would include drugs such as Ocrevus and Rituxan, and the newer drug Ofatumumab, which is not yet licensed. And these drugs deplete the B cells, B lymphocytes. Now, in theory, they would be a little bit lower risk because they don't do anything to the T cells, but B cells are still important in fighting viral infections. They can be the antigen presenting cells. They present foreign material to other immune cells. Also, they create antibodies, and we know that antibodies are important in fighting SARS-CoV-2. So there is definitely an increased risk of taking these medications, potentially of getting COVID-19. Now, some of the studies that have been not yet published looking at people with MS taking these drugs haven't particularly shown an increased risk, and I'll put up a link to a video that I did on some of the data from Italy and France suggesting that these drugs may be somewhat safer than we think. However, they recommend that you consider delaying the drug. Like if you were due to get the drug, you could consider stopping it for a period, even if you're due, like it's six months after the last dose. And the reason is because we have some evidence that these drugs work for somewhat longer than six months. So they write in the article that if the B lymphocyte counts, the, the CD19 and CD20 counts are low, which they often are, even at six months after you've taken the drug, you could consider just holding the dose and just waiting a little bit longer for the pandemic to die down. That's just their opinion. Another drug they talk about is cladribine or mavenclad. And this is a drug that depletes lymphocytes. So you would think that it would be a little bit higher risk than the anti-CD20 drugs or the S1P modulators, but they put it in the same category of intermediate risk. I'm not exactly sure why. One of the good things about this drug is that although it does weaken the immune system, it's only temporary. The immune system does come back over time, and that may be why they think it's not higher risk than the anti-CD20 agents, for example. Then we move on to drugs that they think are higher risk. One such example is mitoxantrone or novantrone. And this is a strong chemotherapy agent. It's not used in multiple sclerosis anymore just because of the risk of heart failure and rare cases of promyelocytic leukemia. So this drug isn't really used, but of course it would be high risk in terms of COVID-19. Another example would be Lymtrata or Alimtuzumab. This is a drug that depletes all lymphocytes, B and T lymphocytes. So potentially it would make you much more susceptible to COVID-19. And they recommend not taking this drug, even if you were due for the treatment during the COVID-19 outbreak, and maybe just 
getting it later on. And of course, another high risk treatment would be hematopoietic stem cell transplant. And that of course works by depleting the immune system as well. And you likely would not want to undergo this treatment unless absolutely necessary during the COVID-19 outbreak. If you have any questions or comments or requests for future videos, please post in the comments below. And please remember, if you have any questions about your own management, I would strongly suggest you talk to your own provider. Best of luck.